So I ask that you bring to the rostrum our brother with a warm round of applause who will be speaking on the subject of why I walk with Farmer I need to get a Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, who came in the person of Master Fad Muhammad, the great Mahdi. I bear witness that he raised one to be an example. To be an example, to show us that he can take one least of us and exalt him to the exalted Christ. And I'm speaking of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I further bear witness that as Moses asked for Aaron, Elijah will ask for a help. And he will be granted that help yes. with a divinely guided one. One who stands in our midst today. One who is willing to give his life for us today. One who is a true reminder to us of what sacrifice looks like. I speak of the divinely guided one the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And I greet you all in the greeting words of peace of Assalam Alaikum. How are you all doing today? All oh, praises be to Allah. You all look beautiful. Brothers, y'all look beautiful. It's all right. No homo. Y'all look beautiful. <laughs> we can say it. You're handsome. I love you. On behalf of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and his local representative, Student Minister Charles, I want to say thank you for this opportunity. I want to also thank my dear brother, Brother Ali Muhammad, for his opening words. And I also want to thank my dear sister, Student Minister Aisha Muhammad, for her opening words. Let's give them a round of applause. Why such a subject? I'm not gonna lie to you. Today I want to be a little selfish. Because I want to talk about why I walk with Farrakhan. Sometimes we can get deep into scriptures and find ourselves out in the galaxy somewhere and the people who are listening have no idea where they went to, where they're at, and how do they get back home. But when I think about the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, I think about a man who has given 60 years, nearly 60 years of his life for the salvation of a people. We're coming on 40 years in absence of his father, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes, sir. See, Minister Farrakhan teaches us that your love will renew your spirit. Excuse me, your love will renew your spirit to continue your labor until you reach your goal. Your love for what you do most, what you do must be deepened. I was born and raised in the nation of Islam. That itself is an honor. During the rebuilding of the nation, sometimes you don't realize how blessed you really are. I have family. My mother, my father, my uncle, my aunt were part of the rebuilding of the nation of Islam. 
I'm speaking of the absence of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Under student minister, excuse me, under Minister Jabril Muhammad. They attended and was in the area of Arizona State University. And I see it on some of the faces for the ones who was around during that time. During this time, there really was no structure like you see now when it comes to the nation of Islam. Really, as long as you believe that Master Fahd Muhammad is God, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad was and is the exalted Christ, and that the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan is the divinely guided one, that was all you needed. During the rebuilding, to get to the minister, when I say get to the minister, talk about the access of Minister Louis Farrakhan was so easy. He didn't have security then. It's just like when you plant a seed in the dirt, there's no one else around you but you and yourself in the work that you have to do to sprout out of the dirt. My parents told me a story, and they were at different times. Once I was in Houston, my father told me this story, and I laughed like you're over-exaggerating. And then maybe a few months later, me and my mother's talking, and she tells me the same story. And I'm like, okay, maybe this is accurate. Well, during the rebuilding, before we had the National House back, as the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan would travel across this country, it wasn't hotels and motels that he would be staying in. He would be staying with the believers who said that they want to help rebuild this nation of Islam. I'm a privileged young man. Because my parents was one of the houses he would rest at. So, there's a time where they're at the coffee table, sitting down, dialoguing. And my parents tell me I came up off the couch and crawled under the coffee table and bent the minister on his ankle. I'm just saying I always wanted some of the juice. All oh, praises be to Allah. See, from that day, y'all don't know. From that day, I've been connected to this man. <laughs> I'm serious. From that day, I've been connected to this man. I wanted what he had. I wanted to be like this man because he, for many of us, is a spiritual father. That's right. That's right. See, even once we got the national house, to be around that family was so easy. I remember spending the night at his son Joshua's house and when him and Sister Marie was still married. And growing up with Malia and Josh and Elijah and Lewis and Farad and Muhammad, Muhammad was still a baby. I remember the time we would play at the National House, that beautiful home you see right on 20th or 21st in Violet. But as you elevate, you have to tighten up and get security. And November of 1984, after my oldest brother made his transition, I'm going to show you why I walk with this man. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan delivered his eulogy. He's never been too big of a man 
to come down That's That's right. to the little people. That's right, right. I walked the far kind. That's right. Come on. I remember being in elementary school and I had to do an essay. And I went to my mother and said, I want to interview the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And I probably called him Uncle Louie back then because everybody was an aunt and uncle to me. When, J student, when Minister Jabril would come by the house, he was Uncle Jabril. And he would greet me, assalamu alaikum, chief. And I'd be like, wa alaikum salam, sir. Jeez. Jeez. And my mother told me, I will reach out to him and see what I can do. A few days later, Brother Jabril comes to the house while I'm working on my project. He greets me, assalamu alaikum, chief. I return the greetings, wa alaikum salam, sir. And he goes to tell me, well, I spoke with the minister and he will not be able to come in to help you with this project. But he did tell me to tell you any questions you have, you can ask me. Go ahead. Right. But you got to remember, I'm young. I got upset. I don't want to interview you. I want to interview the minister. I'm being honest. Now, after some pleading from my mother, we're going to say it nicely, because it wasn't that kind of pleading. Boy, you better get your butt in there. But after getting some stern words from my mother, I found myself sitting down asking questions to Brother Jabril. I, myself, always looked at Brother Jabril as just Uncle Jabril. I never looked at him in scripture. I myself, as a child, always looked at the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan as Uncle Louis. I didn't look at him in scripture. But I've always had a connection to this man. So as I started growing up, I would attend the mosque. But around the time of 1995, the minister would go on a stop to killing tour to help stop black on black violence, black on black crime, because we were killing one another. And just as you heard from Brother Ali, the president at the time did not have that kind of clout. Jesse Jackson did not have that kind of clout. But the minister has that type of clout. That's right, that's right. That he could call for one million and nearly two million show up, not on a Saturday, but you have two peak days in the week, Monday and Friday. He called us out on a Monday. That's right. And we came. See, me personally, I wasn't there, but I wanted to go so bad that when the brothers went, I was there too. And I remember being at my mother's house as the brothers came by before they left. At 11 years old, I drew this picture of the Mall of Washington with many people in the audience and the minister mounted at the rostrum. And as you see the little bubble signs up, it said, get him. Stop him. I don't know what I'm putting in there. I just know we have to protect this man. That's right. But what I'm not knowing is at this time, the minister is so prominent in America that Notorious B.I.G. is mentioning him in his rap songs. That's right. That Public Enemy is mentioning him in their rap songs. That all through hip hop, as hip hop is evolving, they're mentioning the minister in the Million Man March through their music. That's right. The music is being utilized to wake up the masses. Right. Yes. Now, following that lecture, 
Holy Day of Atonement, October 16, 1995. The enemy went into full effect. They did not want you and I to know who the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is. So at that point in time, they went on a campaign to damage and tarnish his name. Even to the point that if he did any good, which that's the only thing he does, you would not hear it out of any media outlet. And then by the time we get to 99, the 2000s, that music that you grew up to, that music you enjoy listening to, had completely changed. It was no longer black consciousness. It was shake your fast, watch yourself. It was Uchi Wally. It was drop down, girl, get your. Y'all acting like y'all don't know the music. That's okay. <laughs> It became very hypersexual. Right. That every song has some kind of sex drive through it. They may not have said, let's have sex. You had Genuine Pony jump on it. You had R. Kelly bumping and grinding. There was no, long, no longer would there be conscious music at that point in time. So as media's ignoring the works of the nation of Islam, they still see that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan still has a pull on the people. So coming 2001, September 11th, which you known as 9-11, two towers get hit and the Pentagon gets hit. And it from there becomes the war on Islam. Yes, sir. See, we think that war was abroad. That was really a threat for us here in America. Because at the end of the day, they don't care about them there. They want the minister off the streets. So the minister being who he is, he will have the men of Islam remove the bow ties and start wearing straight ties. The signature bow ties would allow us to separate ourselves amongst our peers. He will have us blend in with them. That was a chess move. Trying to save our lives. All the way to the point that we start wearing bow ties again when we really start seeing the celebrities wearing them. Now, as I become a teenager, I'm going from the understanding of black and white when I see things to barely going into a gray understanding, but I'm not quite there yet. As you read scripture as a child. You read books or as your parents give you instructions, you only know what's right and what's wrong. During my teenage years is when I started parting away from the nation of Islam and my spiritual father, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. It became challenging for me, challenging for me, to be able to look at us when I'm told we do things this way, but I see the opposite being done. When you see your mother do one thing, but she tells you another. You see your father do one thing, she tell, he tells you another. You see the believers tell you one thing, and you do something else. And you see the community doing whatever they see pleasing to them. So I parted ways. But I not knowing that even though I call myself partying away and I'm partying at that. And I see some of my brothers I grew up with too. So they know how we used to be in the clubs. 
and the house parties, and on the west side, and in Ahwatukee, and Mesa, and Apache Junction, and Litchfield, and Chandler, and Scottsdale. Whoo! We found ourselves away from the guidance of the Honorable Minister Lewis Farquhar. But there is a, a saying that when you put something and you put what you need to put into your children, even though they may go away, what you have put in them will always stay. So no matter what I tried to do to fit in with this world, I still stuck out like a sore thumb. My peers would say, you're very mature for your age. Come on. What do you mean? Well, you know too much. You always talking about this here. We trying to party. Well, you know, I don't drink. I'm just not into it. Well, I mean, we trying to get tips. I'll roll with you. I'll drive. How about that? I feel safer. But I'm not knowing, even though this is going on, I am still attached to my father. So as I'm still in high school, I will still attend Savior's Day. Don't ask me to come to the mosque, though. I'm good. Because at that age, I was bored out of my mind. And I'm putting that out there for a reason. Because there's a certain age where the teens, your children get to, where the mosque and study groups across the nation, even the church across the nation, do not address them at their age. As children, it's easy. Put them in the back, give them somebody to watch them, some pen, paper, some cutting utensils, they'll have fun. But as you start becoming up into your teenage years, sometimes you don't want to sit in the pews and listen to somebody lecture all day. So I parted my ways. The next thing you know, I'm in Houston, Texas in college. At this point in time, I'm so far out there. But one of my sisters, by the name of Nicole, her parents, Sister Sonia Muhammad and Brother Ray Muhammad, she wound up attending the same school as me. And she fell right into the mosque in Houston. Hannibal, you gotta go. Nah, I'm good. You have fun, tell me how it was. Because at that point in time, I did not want to know. I didn't want to hear nothing about no mosque. I wanted to enjoy the world. It was so enticing. But every periodically, if I heard the minister was speaking, I would find myself at Muhammad's Mosque, number 45. When the minister would have Savior's Day and I didn't make it out there, I would be at Muhammad's Mosque, number 45. When Holy Day of Atonement would happen, I would be at Muhammad's Mosque, number 44, or TSU if they held it at a public venue. No matter how far away I tried to part myself from this, I couldn't get away. So when I would hear my father speak, it would resonate with me, but it would not be enough for me to move forward yet. And at that point in time, the gap has started to increase, and I didn't even know it. So sometime through this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about this book, Closing the Gap. That's right. Teach, young brother, teach. It's interesting when planted seeds, because I didn't know there were seeds already planted in me from being in the womb of my mother. From going to the mosque, every meeting, every meeting, <laughs> you, you, Ali know what I'm talking about, man, even at the times when 32 did not have a mosque, a building, 
It was conducted at my mother's house. So I couldn't even run from the mosque. I remember when they would have MGT class at the, my mom's house. Man, couldn't sleep in. Brother, go out there and make sure the car is parked right. Sister Dorana would bring jo um, Joel and Jamil over. I had to watch them. <laughs> Let's go play Mortal Kombat. Come on. No, if y'all make too much noise, let's go outside. Like it ain't the middle of the summer, it's 115 degrees. You got us in the sun during MGT class. I was such a savage. I want y'all to understand this. No, seriously. I would wake up, basketball shorts on, no t-shirt. Then in the middle of MGT class, and I would go in the kitchen and make a big old pan pancake. And be in there trying to flip it, and the sisters will walk in and say, bro, that smell good. What you making? Pancakes, you want some? <laughs> My mama would come in there in a captain type way and curse me out without cursing me out. Boy, you better get your butt up in that room. Go put a shirt on. Why you in here cooking? Cook later. Mom, I'm hungry. But I don't know, I'm such a savage at the time. I was so disrespectful. I was ignorant. I knew not of my ways. But what I do know now is that there were seeds planted within me. So while I'm in Houston, these seeds would try to germinate out of me. They would try to activate within and sprout out. But I had so much filth on me that they would not come out. The next thing you know, I'm telling you, I stayed close. They didn't realize how close I tried to stay to the father. Because in 2005, I'm still a savage in my own ways. But my father called me, you're coming to Washington for the 10th anniversary of the Million Man March. I'm at the mall. I'm on the mall of Washington. I enjoyed the lecture. I got a chance to take my, my stepbrother to back to Hampton in Virginia. But what I don't know is that the seed in me is trying to come out, but that just wasn't enough yet. So next thing you know, a whole year comes around and I'm still asleep. So by the time December 2006 comes around, it happened. The seed pushed through. All oh, praise to be to a Lord. I find myself in my room in a two bedroom apartment. My best friend, who lives right down the street from the National House, y'all probably seen him before, we were roommates. But at that point in time, he parted his way, and one of my friends, she moved into his room. I'm laying on the bed, it's the middle of the night, and I hear a voice, Hannibal, get up. I'm like, yo, bro, what you want, man? It's early, dude, what's wrong with you? Hannibal, get up. Dude, for real. If I get up and punch you in the chest, leave me alone, I'm sleepy. Hannibal, get up, pray. Whoa. <laughs> Did you just say pray? During that time, I recognized, hold on, play live here no more? So who's this man voice I'm hearing? I'm laying in the bed just like a horror movie. I put the sheets over my head. I was, I was a punk. I ain't gonna lie to you, I was a punk. I was like, oh, no. Nah. Then I said, hold up. If I'm gonna die, now man, it said pray. I'm thinking death now. If I'm gonna die, I at least wanna know who's gonna kill me. So I do one of these. <laughs> then I come down. Then it says, get up, pray. Next thing I know, I'm at the foot of my bed on the floor. Tears running 
down my face. I am apologizing to Almighty God Allah for my flaws. Yes, sir. Oh Allah, forgive me. I'm sorry. Yes, I should have been came home. Oh, please forgive me. Oh, Allah, I promise. I promise. If you let me up, I'm coming home. I called my mother. She didn't answer the phone. I called my father. He didn't answer the phone. I'm going through it at this point in time. I'm crazy out of my mind now, right? She finally answers the phone. Now, I'm going to show you. Anytime I called my mother in the middle of the night, this is how much of a savage I was. Anytime I called my mother in the middle of the night, her first response was, what's wrong? Who did you get pregnant? <laughs> I'm serious. Nah, ma, nah, nah, ain't get nobody pregnant. Nah, ma, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I'm crying. I mean, I'm boo-hooing. I'm crying. And I'm like, Ma, grab the Quran. So you knew something was wrong then. Ma, grab the Quran. Please grab the Quran. Boy, what's wrong with you? Just please grab the Quran, Mom. Please grab the Quran. What do you want me to read? I don't know. Just go to something. Start reading. I still don't know where she went to. All I know is she started reading the Quran to me. Is that good? No, keep going. Keep going. And she kept going, keep going, keep going. Then I was like, I'm good. What happened? Then I tell her the same story that I just told you. And she says, so what are you going to do? Now, like I told you, as far as ways I tried to go, for some reason I could not get past the shore. Muhammad's mosque number 45 is right off of 4443 Old Spanish Trail. I was about to get the zip code, but I can't remember it. I lived less than a mile and a half from the mosque. I kept trying to run from it, but I did not go far away from it. I would come up with every excuse to not go there. Where are you going to go? I'm going to the mosque. When? Right now. Wait, what time is it? I don't know, like six in the morning? I pull up to the mosque. I see their sanctuary or the, the building where they, where they hold the meetings. There's no lights on. I see another building, which happens to be the school in the kitchen. I start walking over there because I see lights on. And a sister's on the phone, and she catches my attention. Brother, you need some assistance? There's children already on campus. I'm a threat to security at this point in time. I don't know this. Yes, ma'am. I'm jittering. You would have thought I was on crack. I'm serious. I'm shaking. I need to see that for a while. I need to see that for a while. She's like, brother, you okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. She's like, hold on, brother. She calls her husband. I love the FOI. She calls her husband, Brother Sylvester, who happened to be my first lieutenant. My husband said, give him a call. His name is Sylvester. This is why I love the FOI. I call him. I tell him what's going on. This brother says, yes, sir. OK, this is what I want you to do. This is like a Friday, a Thursday or Friday. This is what I want you to do. I want you to come to the mosque on Sunday. Immediately starts at 10 a.m. I'll talk to you at the mosque. Brother just fish me into the mosque, dude. <laughs> brother, me, I'm a savage at the time. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. I go to the mosque that Sunday. I plan. I shut everything down. Remember, I was trying to avoid it. I shut everything down. I swear to Allah. That day that student minister Robert spoke, I felt like we were sitting right here. Brother, I know what you're going through. When he asked for acceptance, I did just like this. <laughs> yes, sir. Then I walked up to the front. He asked, brother, what's your name? I said, Hannibal Muhammad. 
He said, brother, you know what your name means? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, brother, you got a lot of work to do. And from that day, I picked up my cross and started walking with Farrakhan. All oh, praises be to Allah. Now, during this time period, I'm so eager, I literally will run to the doors. You couldn't slow me down. I was moving so fast, they thought I was gonna be one of those six month brothers. See, the ones in the nation know what I'm talking about. The ones who come in going real hard, and you try to see how long they gonna last, and then that six month mark come and they go, boop. They fall straight out. But they didn't know I had something on my shoulders. See, when I was on that floor praying to Allah, I made a covenant with him that day. I made a promise to him that day. And I told him I was going to give my life to this. And I was so afraid of being disobedient to him <clears throat> that I was afraid that he would take my life if I fell out. I ain't talking about falling out the mosque. I'm talking about physically taking me out of this world. <clears throat> Excuse me. So next thing you know, I mean, hold on. Let me say this part, just so you understand. Brother was rocking a purple suit <laughs> with purple candy color gators on. I had locks in my hair. Now, I love locks. I, I wish I could still get them, but I had locks in my hair. That's That was me. <clears throat> You dress like a pimp, you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? You want to look good. That was me. You want to be, you know, that, that fly. Next thing I know, I'm coming around 2007. My mother flew me into Detroit, Michigan for Savior's Day. This is the same year they were wondering if the minister was going to make it. This is the same year the minister was on his deathbed. Me not knowing a few months earlier, I'm on my bed making a covenant to Allah to come help this man who's going to soon be on his deathbed. I'm telling you, I've always been attached to this man. So next thing you know, my return. I'm here. But the thing that excites me the most, what people don't know, and I hope my, I wonder if I ever told my mom this. Ma, I know you're in the audience, I can see. When I moved to Houston, I took your book, This Is The One. I hope you wasn't looking for it. Thank you, sir. So by the time, see I always, for some reason, every blue moon, I would pick up the book. I would just want something to read and I would just start reading through it. See, to me, Brother Jabril was just Uncle Jabril who's a writer. That's how I looked at him. Uncle Jabril, he's a writer. He writes great books. By the time I come into the nation, this book is being introduced. Yes, sir. Closing the gap. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm not knowing at this point in time, I have a gap. I'm closing myself to Almighty God Allah to the messenger, and to the minister. So now I start reading this book, and I'm looking at the questions that Brother Jabril's posing to the minister. And I go from, yeah, Jabril, oh, my all praises be to Allah. Gabriel, Jabril, ooh, Michael, ooh, hold on. I don't know who you two are. Now I'm really digging deep into my scriptures because I'm really loving this. Because I'm having fun. You give me a second. I remember I was watching Martin one time when he was doing his stand-up comedy. And he was like, can I drink some water? He was like, go ahead, drink some water. Ask him. So give me one second. <laughs> Another change in out here, so. I'm going to close the gap. If you open Closing the Gap to page 
39 and 40. And you go to Phoenix, Arizona. I'm blessed to know these names. Y'all mind if I read some of them off real quick? Yes, Brother Britton Muhammad, yes, back corner. <laughs> Brother Bobby Muhammad, Brother Carlos Muhammad, Sister Edith Muhammad, yes, <clears throat> Brother Gary A. Muhammad, Brother Gary C. Muhammad, Brother Hakeem Muhammad, Brother Hannibal Muhammad. So when I came into the mosque, they was like, Brother, you, you, you wrote this book with Brother Jabril? <laughs> no, no, no. My father helped in that. I didn't realize they started asking me questions about Brother Jabril. Brother, how's he doing? When was the last time you talked to him? I'm like, it's Uncle Jabril. I didn't even read the book yet. So as I started going into the book, I started fighting harder to close that gap with my spiritual father. See, one thing I know about the Minister Lewis Farrakhan is on page 47 of Closing the Gap, it says this. For Allah, our God, so loved the world that he is only begotten son. He gave. He sacrificed him. And the son was willing to be sacrificed. Minister, I have no life of my own. My life is for the redemption of a people, and that is pretty hard. However, that is the necessary requirement to affect resurrection, redemption, restoration, and reconciliation of the soul that is lost. And he said, in conclusion, when a person is like that, he has no sin. He has shortcomings for sure. And he may commit sin. But by his long suffering and continuing to pull on the good nature of Allah, God, and the people to make them better and better and better, Allah, God, just wipes away sin that he has and throws it in the sea of forgetfulness and forgives his sin. Because of the work that he does of redemption, this is why Jesus is looked at as absolutely perfect and sinless. That's why I walk with Farrakhan. Because he has no life of his own. And the sins that he may commit, they're thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. Because he gives his life for us every single day. Man. See, during the life, if you go in and read this book in the life of the minister, he lost his job a few times. A few times. But one of them, he lost his job because he saw something happening to a person. And the police beat him up, picked him up, and drove off with this person. And he went chasing after the police car, yeah. abandoning his job because he wanted to make sure nothing happened to that person. This is a man of humility. Did you know he had humble beginnings? With him and his wife, Mother Khadijah, when they were coming up after they got married and had children, they would go to the Boston Marketplace and buy groceries. Excuse me. Let me rephrase that because it's not accurate. No. The grocery store, the marketplace will be closed. And they would take the groceries. They would pick through the groceries that were thrown out to the street so they could go home and feed their Family. Yes. See, no, no. This man gives his life for us every single day. He had one suit. He had one pair of shoes. He was giving a demonstration in the man's class. And during the demonstration, the man saw holes at the bottom of his shoes. He didn't 
complain about that. Right. But because his wife is working in boxing shoes. This brother has been going to Christ since day one. See, this enemy attacks his name every single day. If you go to social media, every day someone's attacking his name. If you go to Google search, every day someone's writing an article trying to tarnish his name. Even with all that that has been thrown at him, in all of the attacks he goes through, this man still prevails. That's why I walk with Farrakhan. See, which that taught me, no matter what people do or say about you, you should not allow it to keep you from what Allah has placed on your heart to achieve. Fight through the adversity. Fulfill your purpose in life. Because that's what he's doing every day for us. See, when you walk with Allah, he will show you their hands. Talking about the enemy. He'll also show you your helpers. He'll show you who are your enemies. He'll show you who are the hypocrites. You just got to walk with him. He will protect you from the front. He'll watch your back. He'll guard your sides. Ooh, what a friend we have in Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Who guides us on the straight path. Every single day. He makes decisions we may not agree with, with our little understanding. He sees prophecy. So he puts things in place so that we can be guided to it. But we want to fight and be disrespectful to the man who's guiding us. Come on. See, that's why I walk with Farrakhan. See, I want you to understand some who you're looking at. If something happened to Barack Obama today, they were sworn in Biden to be the president, who is his vice president, right? Yes, sir. Okay. I want you to know, when you're looking at Farrakhan, that's not who you're looking at. I'm going to say that again. When you look at him, you are not looking at Farrakhan. Minister Farrakhan died years ago, and I stand on that. When you look at Farrakhan, you are looking at the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You have to understand, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad put this man in his chair. He said, no, brother, not there. You sit here in my chair. Right. Oh, y'all think I'm playing. No. Let's go to John 16, 28. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. How about 638? For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. 1431. But so that the world may know that I love the Father. I do exactly as the Father commanded me to get up. Let us go from here. That's him guiding us. 519. Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. 1030, I and the father are one. Yes. Right. When you look at him, you are not looking at Louis Farrakhan. Who are looking at the Honorable Elijah Muhammad who lives through this man. 
Six four four. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him, and I will raise him up on the last day. John ten fifteen. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. John fifteen ten. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments. Abide in His love, and in Matthew twenty six thirty nine, and He went a little beyond. And fell on his face and prayed, saying, "As from me, yet not as I, but as you will." I'm gonna tell you. Keep listening to the honorable minister Lewis Falcon's love song. We will feel that wrath of Allah, and that's the wrath we do not want to feel. I'm telling you, you do not want to be unclear. When it's time to put the lamb's blood on the top and the side of your doors. When the law of plagues come. Because what you're seeing with the weather right now is just a small comparison of what's going to be. See, these signs are just warning signs for us to clean ourselves up. Because the Honorable Minister Louis Farhan is a divinely guided man. He's so divinely guided that he led us to Dianetics. Yes. Yeah, I said it. Yes. We are not part of the science, the, the Church of Scientology. Wow. But there is a tool in the Church of Scientology called Dianetics. Right. Right. And he's led us to this tool to help clear up some of our pain and struggles right. Right. of our past. Right. See, our enemy attacks us through our pain, struggles, and emotions. So as long as we're emotional, they have us locked into their grip. He needs us to be clear-minded. Mm -mm -mm. I'm telling you, this man right here, in the supreme wisdom, in the rules of instructions to the laborers, it says, according to the Holy Quran 59.7, the Muslims were very poor when they first started to teach Islam. And all contributions was given to Allah's apostle for him and his family's support. And what the apostle could spare, he gave to help take care of the poor Muslims that were unable to help themselves. And the other part was given to those who were confined to the labor of Islam. Minister Lewis Farquhar writes checks all the time helping families. He don't, he don't run around bragging, look who I gave a check to. Look who I donated to. A few years ago, Haiti got hit. And they need a, a, a water purification system. If I'm right, I think it costs over 50000 I know they got a water purification system in Haiti now. We don't, we don't run around talking about where's the news cameras. We need to do a press conference. Look what we're doing. This man sacrifices and gives to the ones who need it. He pays for funerals. He gets people out of debt. He pays for school for people to go through. Man, y'all gonna keep sleeping on this man. In the time of what must be done, he gave us a 58-week lecture series. That's right. And in one of them, he gave us the shadow government who holds secret from, who holds secrets from the president. He's exposing a shadow government that we don't know nothing about. You say he ain't divinely guided. He ain't no leader. All right. He gave us the divine instructions this past Savior's Day. And in those divine instructions, he gave us 35 commands and instructions that we live our lives through. And what came of that was the 10,000 fearless. 
in the past. You cannot get to the minister once security and once he evolved, which means he's being exalted. Anytime you have a question for the minister, he's accessible to you through social media now. Nearly every day you see a post come up through Twitter or Facebook, even Instagram, from the Honorable Minister Lewis Farquhar of Divine Guidance. This is why I walk with this man. And it's an honor to walk with this man. It's an honor to bear witness to the man of God. This man has saved my life. That's the least I can do. He's built confidence in me. You know how hard it is to walk around with the name Hannibal as a child? I'm serious. Hannibal the cannibal. Hannibal Lecter. What you eating today? You got brains on the plate? Hey, Clarice. I mean, I got it all. <laughs> I'm serious. But me bear witness to him and what he goes through built confidence in me to endure those challenges. See, when I was a child, I didn't want to be called Hannibal. You want to know what the most popular name to be called was back then? Michael. You had Michael Jordan. You had Mike Tyson. You had Michael Jackson. Ma, can I change my name to Michael? I requested it. <laughs> she might have said yes. <laughs> I've been vegetarian way before vegeta being a vegetarian was popular. Born and raised vegetarian. It's popular now. So my name's Hannibal, and I don't eat no meat. Oh, I got it all growing up. No, I've never had a steak before. No, I've never had ribs before. And no, I've never had pork chops before. No pork on my plate. And no, I don't know what I'm missing. Because I've never had it. All oh, praises be to Allah. And that takes me to this point. On social media, one of, my, one, of, one of my sisters, I don't know her that well, I don't know her, but she put out a little meme, a little video. And she was posing a question to the Nation of Islam. Y'all may have seen it. She said she has a friend. Y'all already laughing, I ain't even told the story yet. Said she has a friend. She asked some questions. She was like, talk about the black Muslims in America, especially the Nation of Islam. When did Muslims start eating pork? And she said she has a friend. You know, she's a comedian. She's having fun. She said she has a friend who says, you know, it's Tuesday. They was out eating. He was like, yeah, let me get this pork this, pork that. She's like, bro, I thought you was Muslim. He said, yeah, but um, that's on, yeah, I'm, I'm good on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Tuesdays and Thursdays? But no, I thought y'all don't eat pork. No, no, we good on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Hold on. Y'all got part-time Muslims? No, man, we don't have no part-time Muslims. We don't eat pork. When you walk with Farrakhan, you put that down. Right. See, when you walk with Farrakhan, you throw that poison away. Right. The first time you see the video, when you see some pork and the worms start coming, you go to your refrigerator and freeze start tossing it out. Right. So no mail. And tell that brother to call me. We need to have a conversation. Yes, and to any brothers and sisters who's eating pork, get off it. Right. Get off it. Right. Not even the pork. The Pork white products, get off it. They already poison us with everything else. Let's not give them any extra. So no mail, no, we don't we don't eat pork. And tell brother Ahmad, Hahad, whatever his name was, to holler at me. We gotta have a conversation because he's making the nation look bad. I gotta talk to the brother. <laughs> but I'm serious. The honorable minister Louis Farcon has saved my life. And I'm pretty sure as I look at some of your faces, he saved your life too. And even the ones that this is your first time out, he saved your life, even if you don't know it. Because when you see the six and they talk about being pro-black, that came from the nation of Islam first. They were saying we are Negroes. No, we are black, because black is universal. There's no ending to darkness. 
That's why we create every shame. When you wake up and you do things, I guarantee that some kind of influence came from the nation of Islam and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. You see Colin Kaepernick, that's the birth child of the minister. That comes from his era of rebuilding the nation. Who said, I'm taking the knee. Well, we don't, we don't, we don't, what's what I'm looking for? We don't follow the nation of, excuse me, we don't follow the national anthem. My whole childhood was, boy, you better sit down. I used to get in trouble once, boy, you better sit down. Well, my, my boy, we don't play that. We want us to stand and put our hands on our heart for an anthem that does not represent us. Come on, man. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has been influencing this world for a long time. He just does not go out and say, hey, look at what I have done. This is the man who's going to carry us on his shoulders across the river, across the Red Seas. He's going to get us to the other side. He's going to take us to the mountaintop, and he's going to brag on it. He's going to say, look what I have done. He's going to say, look at the life of us. Because that's a humble man. All oh, praises be to Allah. But yes, he has saved my life. He's the reason why I'm married today. I told you I was a savage. I told you when I called my mom, she'll be like, boy, who you get pregnant? He taught me the value of woman. Because I was trying to see the value of women. He said, no, brother, the value of one woman. Singular. Singular. See, when he teaches you the value of marriage, you can see it coming out of him. Him and his wife, Mother Khadijah, just made 63 years. Top beer. Top beer. Top beer. That just simply means God is the greatest. See, he taught me the value of community and family. He taught me the reason for security mentally, spiritually, and physically. That I want to secure and take care of my family. If me take care of my family helps me to produce and take care of a proper community. Because if I'm not taking care of my wife and children, how can I help take care of a community at large? And I'm so thankful to that. They got 63 years. I need that. I need my years times times nine because my this December, my wife and I make seven, if it be the will of Allah. All yes, oh, praises be to Allah. <laughs> See that comes from the science of mating. Our enemy don't teach us that. That's right. They teach us the science of having sex and jumping on the next one, like we used to do through slavery. Tell me, this man will save your life. He has transformed lives. Some of us was drug dealers. Some of us was strung out on drugs. Some of us was alcoholics, game bangers, hustlers, thieves, prostitutes. Not anymore. We all have a story we can tell of how the life-giving teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad through the guidance of the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan has transformed our lives. Right. See, this man is a surgeon with the word play. He drops it on you in a way that it don't hit you too hard, but it sits on you. And then when it's time, it pops. And you're like, man, I don't want to do that no more. I'm good. Good, get away from me. I'm trying to change my life. Tell you why I walk with Farcon, man. I've been blessed. And you have too. Last year, my wife and I gave birth to our, our second child, Eliah. Eliah was a home birth. We didn't go to the hospital. We delivered that child in our house. Because we didn't want to be part of Vaxxed. Right, right, yes. If you haven't seen the movie, go see. We didn't want them trying to force vaccinations on our child. That's right, that's right. That's right. But during February of last year, I reached out to the minister and I asked him, 
would he be willing to name our child? And he was trying to work it out between delivering the keynote lecture and getting time for us for it. But we always have a plan B just in case. So we named her Eliah. Then we printed up little, like, not invitation cards, but, like, the birth announcement cards with a picture and stuff on it. And it got to him. And someone within the family informed me that he took the card, he kissed the baby, and he lifted it up in the sky, and he made a prayer for this child. I'm a blessed man. When his child was born, she was still in the sack, which is, a, which is rare. That does not happen often. See, that's coming through the science of mating and walking with a man who will guide you the right way. That when my daughter walks in the room, she lights it up. That the believers are like, oh my God, I love her. She's a, she has a certain vibe about her. When she smiles, you can look in her eyes and tell she knows something. I'm waiting for her to talk so she can tell me what she knows too. <laughs> oh, praises be to Allah. This past January, February, February, early this year, I'm going to tell you, I'm a blessed man. I was at work. And the minister came in. Sat down in my office. I got a chance to talk to the Honorable Minister Louis Farcon one on one for about 30 minutes. You know how hard it is to get that close to the man of God? Yes. And during our conversation, he said, Brother, I pray, and I'm paraphrasing, that Allah gives you what you need this year to make it one of your best years. And that whatever you have in your heart, Allah allows you to handle and be able to move forward with those endeavors. So every morning I wake up to that conversation resonating in my mind. I'm constantly thinking about my future. My future. And I can't wait till next Sunday. I can't wait till next Sunday. To be in full effect, in person, to see the Honorable Minister Louis Farca at the 21st yes. anniversary of the Holy Day of Atonement, the Million Man March. Yes. Come on, man. They've been trying to take this man off the planet. They plan the law plans, and the law is the best of planners. You can't touch him. Try if you want to. The minister will be breaking down our future and the future of America with these two candidates running, Lucifer and, excuse me, <laughs> Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. My bad, my bad. Which, which way you want to go? You want Lucifer saying anyway. He's going to help us prepare for our future. To my youth, to my young ones who are able to vote now. You think voting is the way, I tell you, it is not the way. You can give them whatever power you want to give them, they're not going to do anything for you and I. The power is in us. The power is in our unity. As long as we come together, we don't need their votes. Go to the Asian community, I wonder if they vote. I wonder if they vote. They're like, we don't need them. We run our own community. That's right. That's right. I wish a police officer would roll through their community. What you want? I ain't gonna be disrespectful. I was gonna make up some Asian language, but I ain't gonna do that. What you want? I wish you would. He, they said to study them. Why don't we study the Asians? Why don't we observe the Asians and how they function? Minister Farrakhan says, you can rise above any condition you're in with knowledge. See, some of the problem we have is we're beating down on the young people. 
how do you beat down on the young people when Minister Farrakhan said, this generation of youth are the greatest? See, Farrakhan does not fear the youth. He sees the importance in them. It seems that we fear our youth. We teach them, we, we say we want them to be better than us. We give them everything we couldn't have so they can go beyond us. And as soon as they challenge our level of thought, we want to push them back down. Instead of allowing and helping them to exalt their greatness so that they can carry us on to the other side. The minister says, black youth, you have something to offer to the world. But if you simply get in where you fit in, you will not make a contribution. The youth is the future leaders, the future thinkers. They are the future heirs of the throne. So to my youth, Brother Yassin said the 16 to 35, I think youth is a, is a spiritual thing, but you do need to be physically in shape, so I think 1635 does work since I'm 32. I'll take claim to that one. In Deuteronomy 31.6, it says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord, your God, goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. I want you to understand, youth, I'm still talking to you. If you ever played any sport before, whoever's the starting quarterback, the starting basketball player, point guard, shooting guard, center, and you come on that team, they ain't gonna just give you that position unless they soft. But they're not gonna just give you the position. You have to fight for that position. You think Peyton Manning just wanted to give up his spot? You think Tom Brady just wants to give up his spot? You gotta come and earn that spot. If you want, to, if you want that position, go and take that position. Work for that position. Because if you're not willing to fight for it, why should you have that position? But that's not enough. Let me keep going. In Galatians 6, 9, it says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Let me read that again. Let us not become weary, exhausted in doing good. For at the proper time, the time and what must be done. We will reap a harvest. We will reap mature crops, mature mental crops, mature spiritual crops, mature physical land and crops if we do not give up. See, sometimes we got to nag like children. If you really want it. See, if you see the starting quarterback on the field and you want to get in, you don't go sit on the bench somewhere. You go stand next to the coach. And you wait your turn. Every time the coach turn left, you turn left too. Coach turn right, you turn right too. You run out to the field, you run out with him. So you want him to know that you're there. So you have to, you have to nag like a child in the candy store. Or a child in the store going down the candy aisle. And anybody got children know how that feel. You push that aisle and you try to, you try to avoid that. And you're like, oh, I ain't going that aisle. And you're like, ah, oh, I got to grab that. And that rest of the time you in the store, what's that child going to do? Ma, ma, dad, for real, come on, please, please. I just want one. They're going to nag you the whole time till you're going to let them hold it. You might pull it out before you go through, aisle, through the line or you're going to let them take it to the car with you. But you have to be willing Willing to put that kind of effort in if you want to see it. 
see it. So to you, I want